Let's go back and look at divide and conquer again. So recall the divide and conquer paradigm consists of breaking up a problem into disjoint subproblems. Then we solve each of these subproblems separately and then we combine them efficiently to form a solution to the original problem. So we have seen two examples of divide and conquer. Merge sort is a classic example of divide and conquer where we divide the list to be sorted or the array to be sorted into two equal parts. We sort these two parts separately and then we efficiently merge them into a sorted list. Quick sort has a different strategy. What it tries to do is avoid the merging step. So you rearrange the original list so that you have a lower and upper partition with respect to a pivot. Having rearranged them, you can sort the lower half and the upper half independently. And now because they are already rearranged, you don't have to merge them. So basically there is a cost involved with setting up the subproblems and a cost involved with combining the subproblems. And if this setup cost and combination cost is efficient, then the overall solution gives you something much better than a direct, direct approach could. So let's look at the following situation. Very often when you go to an online store, you find a recommendation. For example, it would say that customers like you were interested in books like these or customers who bought this phone also look for this pair of headphones. Right? So these services are recommended to you based on your profile. The online service maintains some profile information about what you like and what you don't like. It compares what you like and don't like with others and identifies a similar category of people. And then it looks for products or services that that category has opted for, which you have not, and then recommends these to you. Right? So a fundamental step in such a recommendation system is that of comparing profiles. Right? How does one person's likes, how do one person's likes and dislikes compare to those of others? So one instance of this is when you have preferences over things like movies or books. So suppose over a sequence of time you have gone to some website and entered your preferences about movies that you have watched. So say there are five movies, let us just call them A, B, C, D and E, which both you and somebody else have ranked on this website. So you, in general, two individuals will come up with different rankings. So perhaps you ranked D first and E last and your friend ranked B first and E last. So you both agree that E was the worst, but you disagree on whether B or D was better. In fact, your friend thinks D was so bad that it was actually only next to E in, from the bottom. Right? So D which was your first has become your friend's fourth. So now what we can do is we can take two such sets of rankings and ask how similar or dissimilar they are. So one way of measuring this is to compare how you rank pairs of movies. Right? So for each pair of movies you can compare whether you rank one better than the other and your friend also does or you don't. So here for instance if you look at B and C Okay, then this is ranked in a similar way by you and your friend. Okay. On the other hand, if you look at D and B, right, then in one case you rank B above B and your friend ranks B above D. Right. So we don't particularly care how far apart they are, how many other things there are. We're just saying given choice of two things, which do you prefer, which does your friend prefer and combine these choices across all the choices available in the given list. Right? So what we are trying to do is measure the dissimilarity in terms of what we can call inversions. Right? How many pairs of movies are ranked in an opposite way between you and your friend. So if you, if you and your friend rank every pair of movies in the same order, then your total order of preferences must be the same. Right? So if there are zero inversions, then you are exactly similar in your taste to your friend and the rankings are identical. On the other hand, if you have n movies, right, then you can do n choice, n choose two pairs, right? So the number of different pairs of movies are n choose two, which is n into n minus one by two. Right? So if every possible movie you disagree with your friend, then the number of inversions will be n into n minus one by two, which is of order n square. Right? So you can use now this as a measure, how many pairs are out of order, as a measure of how similar or dissimilar two sets of rankings are, and this could be used for instance, in this recommendation system to decide which customers to compare when making a recommendation. So you only want to pick customers 
who are close to the one whose recommendation is being made. There's no point in recommending something that a person is not going to like because you're comparing it with somebody who has very different tastes. So we can formulate this in another way. So now we take our ranking and we assume that that is the given order. Right? So we picked a certain order for the movies and we call that the basic ranking 1, 2, 3, 4 up to n. Now our friend's ranking would rank what we called 1 as maybe 5, what we called 2 as maybe 3 and so on. Right? So everything that we rank with a rank i will be ranked by a different rank j by our friend and of course every rank will appear there somewhere or the other. So the friend's ranking will be a permutation of 1 to n. And what you're asking is if I rank i before j, that is if i is a smaller number than j, does the friend rank j before i? Any such thing would be an inversion, right? So an inversion would be a pair i comma j in my list where i is smaller than j. So in my list i is ahead of j, but in my friend's list j appears before i in that permutation. Okay, so let's look at this a little more concretely. So supposing this was our original example, so there were five movies A, B, C, D, E and I rank them or you rank them as D, B, C, A, E, then I would say that D is 1, B is 2, C is 3, A is 4 and E is 5. Okay, so this is my original list 1 to 5. Now, because I have this correspondence between the movies and the things and the, and the rankings, then I know that B for instance is 2, right? So B is 2, A is 4, C is 3, D is 1 and E is 5, right? So from this list of preferences, I can rewrite it as a reordering of my ranking. And now we are asking when whether there are pairs like this, 2 and 1, right? So 2 appears before 1 in my friends list. It appears after 1 obviously in the original list. So this is an inversion. So 2, 1 is an inversion. Like, likewise, 4, 1 is an in inversion. So is 3, 1. Okay, so we have these three inversions, whether we can write them as 1, 2 or 2, 1, 1, 3 or 3, 1, because these are pairs. Okay, so it doesn't, the order is not important. These pairs of movies are ranked oppositely by you and your friend. And the final inversion in this particular example is 3 and 4, right? So 3 and 4 appear in opposite order. You can check that for every other pair, for example, 4, 5 or 2, 3 or 2, 4, right? The order is preserved. So there are four inversions in this particular list between your ranking and your friend's ranking. And our goal is to count this number of inversions given two permutations. So another way of thinking about this, though it will not materially affect how we compute it, is to draw this kind of a graph. So you take the rankings to start with as the correct order on top. So you have one set of vertices 1 to 5 and then you have a permutation of the vertices 1 to 5 listed in the order of your friend's ranking. And then you combine 1 to 1, 2 to 2 and so on so that you build up this graph which has if you have 5 on top and 5 in the bottom, you have 5 edges. If you have n and n, you have n edges. Now in this graph, every time a line crosses, this indicates a mismatch, right? So 2 has gone ahead of 1, likewise 4 has gone ahead of 3 and so on, right? So there are 4 crossings between these lines and that really corresponds to 4 uh, inversions in this example. So now there is a very simple brute force way to check because we know that every inversion is a pair ij such that j appears before i in my friends list. So we can just check that, right? So we can just check for every i and every j which is different from i whether i and j is an inversion and this will give us a brute force order n squared algorithm, okay? So this actually enumerates all the inversions. It checks every possible pair and if it is an inversion, it says yes. If it's not an inversion, it says no and then you count how many inversions you saw. And we saw that we could actually in the worst case have a complete set n into n minus 1 by 2 inversions. So this will exhaustively enumerate every inversion and check it for yes or no. So our goal is to give a more efficient algorithm. So we will move to this divide and conquer paradigm. So suppose your friend's permutation, see our permutation is always 1 to n. So we can just assume it is given. So what is really interesting is our friend's permutation, right? So the friend's permutation is some order of 1 to n jumbled up. Let us call it i1 to i n. So now we will do something similar to merge sort. So we will take this list i1 to i n and divide it into two parts, right? So we have i1 to i n by 2, which is the left, and i n by 2 plus 1 to n, which is the right. So divide and conquer is a very simple-minded strategy. You can only do one thing. You can solve this. You can solve this, and then you can combine. 
right? So this is the basic paradigm. So you have to divide, solve the divided parts and combine. Right? So we will recursively assume that we can count the inversions in left and right. Now what is left to count are those inversions which cross the boundary. So is there a J i pair that looks like this? Right? This would not be counted when I count only the left because i is not in the left. It will not be counted only in the right because j is not in the right. So there would be an inversion where i is less than j as numbers but j appears in the left, i appears in the right. So this has to be done after we have solved the recursive thing. So this is basically the combination step. How many elements in the right are bigger than elements in the left? Right? Anything on the left, if it is smaller than something on the right, then it's not an inversion because it's already in the correct order in the overall list. But if something on the right is bigger than something on the left, then that's an inversion. You have to count all such pairs. So in order to solve this, we will make our recursive procedure a little stronger than just counting. Right? So we will assume that not only do we count in the two halves, we sort them while we are counting. Right? So what happens is now we divide our problem into two parts. Okay? And then we come back. So this is my L and this is my R. I have now sorted L, sorted R and I have a count also. I have a count L and a count R. Right? Now the fact that these are sorted means that I can do some kind of merging. So I can use a version of merge. So we would describe a version of merging which allows us to count. So this gives us another count. And then we'll have three counts, the left count, the right count, and the count returned by merge. So what we want to do while merging is to actually check how many elements on the right are bigger than how many elements on the left. So how do we do this? So what is the principle of merge and count? So remember that an inversion across L and R consists of an element in R. Okay. So we have an element in R and an element in L. Okay, such that this big, this number is smaller than this number. Right? So we have some, some i here and some j here such that i is smaller than j. Right? So what will happen in our merge procedure is at some point, right? so we are merging, so we pick the smaller of these two and pull it out. Okay? So anytime now if I pull out an element from here, okay, that means that at this current point I have merged up to this and up to this. So there are two pointers in my list left and right, the sorted list, up to which the merge has proceeded so far. Now at this point I choose the right hand side element because it is smaller. So how much, if it is smaller, okay, then it is smaller than everything which I have not yet looked at. That's why because it is smaller than the first element I am looking at in L, it's therefore smaller than everything else in L because everything else in L is sorted with respect to this. Right? So therefore this entire segment which is left in L corresponds to elements which are smaller than the current element I am pulling out from R. In other words, this element in R contributes as many inversions as there are elements in L at the point when it is extracted in the merge process. Right? So whenever I add an element from R to the output, it is inverted with respect to all the elements currently in L. So I should add the current size of L to the number of inversions. Right? So this gives us our merge and count. While we are merging, every time we pull from the left, there is no inversion. Every time we pull from the right, we see how many elements are still remaining in the left and that many items need to be added to our inversion count. So here is the merge procedure for merge and count which is very similar to the merge procedure in the basic merge sort. So we have two lists A and B to be merged, both are sorted. Okay, And A has M elements and B has N elements and we want to produce an output list C which has n plus n elements. So we begin with assigning a pointer to tell us how far we have gone in each list which is set to 0. Right? And now we have to keep track of the number of inversions. So we keep a variable called count which is initialized to 0, the total number of inversions which have been seen so far. So so long as something is there to move into C, we move something. So the two cases, the first case is to move from A. So either B is empty, J is equal to n or the element at the head of A, AI is smaller than or equal to BJ, in which case we do the usual thing, we copy the ith element of A into CK and then we increment both I and K. The other case is when either A is empty, I is equal to M or BJ has a smaller value. In this case, we have possibly an inversion. Right? 
So how many inversions do we have? We have exactly m minus i inversions. We have as many inversions as, so if this is i, we have as many inversions as our elements currently in A, which is m minus i. Now notice that in the special, specific case where we are copying from B because A is empty, we have i equal to m. So this would actually be 0. right? So there should not be an inversion if we are just duplicating B and C because A is exhausted. But that's also taken care of by m minus i being 0. So Although we are updating the count, we are actually not adding anything to it. So only when we are doing a non-trivial merge, that is when we are moving something from B when A is still not empty, do we increment the count. If we are moving because we have run out of elements in A, count will remain the same. So at the end of this merge procedure, we, end, we return the number of uh, inversions we saw plus the merged list. So now we incorporate our merge procedure into the merge sort with counting as follows. So as usual, we will sort in general an array from some left index to some right index because we will sort different segments at different times. So if the current segment to be sorted has length 1, then there is nothing to be done. We just set up a new, the sorted segment is just the value that we see and there is no inversion because there is only one value. On the other hand, if it is bigger than 1, then we compute the midpoint and we do these two recursive calls. Each of them will return the count on the left and the right respectively. Then we call our merge procedure and get a count from the merge section. So then our total number of inversions is the count from the left, the count from the right and the count from the merge together and the new array is the one returned by merge. Right? So this is a very simple extension of merge sort which allows us to count inversions which is useful for our recommendation system. So the analysis of course given that the structure is so similar to merge sort the analysis is similar. We have this recurrence for the time taken on n steps. So t of 1 is 1 and t of n is 2 times tn by 2 plus n exactly as for merge sort because it only takes us linear time to merge sort with count. Right? So when we merge with count, it takes the same amount of time as merging without counting. So we solve this and we get n log n. Now one important thing to note is when we did our brute force calculation, right? we looked at every possible pair and decided whether or not it was an inversion. So we actually explicitly counted the inversions to get the answer. Now here, we are doing it in n log n, which is potentially much smaller than the number of inversions altogether. So we are actually counting the number of inversions or estimating or actually calculating how many inversions are there without actually counting them manually one by one. Because there could be n squared inversions, but even if there are n squared inversions, we could find that out in n log n time. Right? So we are not manually counting every step Rather, we are getting this through uh, our recursive calculation. 